So we're here with Andrew, Phil and Mark from The Shades uh, for the first time that we're going to interview them on Loud Hailer. We first saw you guys um, down at MERS Showcase. That's Edinburgh Bante for those people listening who runs a showcase in Chicago at Navy Pier in 2018 when you brought the rain, <laughs> I believe. So unintentionally. <laughs> unintentionally. A yeah. unintentionally. But welcome, welcome along. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for coming in. So um, to start with, I was just going to ask, um, you know, ask, ask you to tell us a little bit about the band and how you guys got together, how it all got started. It's a great question. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's one, we're, we're a band with a lot of history, um, particularly the guys to my right and my left. Um, they're brothers, so they, uh, they grew up together. And um, we met uh, actually a little over 10 years ago now at the University of Miami. Uh, which is where Mark and I uh, lived down the hall from each other and were roommates for a number of years. And, uh, and Phil graduated from that school as well. Um, actually, when he graduated uh, that fall, we came in as freshmen. Yeah. Uh, and so definitely a little bit younger than Phil. Um, <laughs> you want to get that in? He, he has to say that every time. He has to let everybody know. As I'm only going to say it as long as it's true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Worth mentioning that it's a pretty good day for you guys today, right? Score-wise? Oh, the- yes. <laughs> yeah. It happens, it happens to be a good... It hasn't been a great season so far, but it's been a good day um, for University of Miami football, um, which I, th- I think we can attest is one reason, not the reason, one reason why we chose to attend that, that school for college uh, <laughs> is because we enjoy college athletics, but that's not why we became a band. Um we uh we kind of have very similar uh our paths kind of crossed many times before we became a band um and particularly one memory that i have is um as a freshman in college uh one of the first couple days of school i remember getting a uh like an all call email uh from kind of like the campus music school and um they were they were asking for men to audition for a jazz vocal group, um, which I knew I wanted to be involved in music. I wasn't a music major myself, but I knew I wanted to. I wanted to sing. I'd been singing my whole life, and uh, I couldn't really picture myself not doing that. And so I got this email about auditioning for a, a, a jazz vocal group, and I was like, "Jazz sounds more similar to rock and roll than classical does, <laughs> yeah. or opera, or something <laughs> like that." And so. Uh, that, that sounds like something I want to be part of. So, uh, that day I went down the hall a couple doors to see, um, this kid who was becoming my friend at that time named Mark Jacobson. And I told him about this email that I got, uh, from this jazz vocal group. And I was telling him about, about the email and reading it. And he was like, Oh wow. He was like, my brother was in that group for four years. He was like, that's a really tough group to get into. And I was like, sounds good. I think I'm going to get in. (laughs) Um, and lo, lo and behold, I did, I did in fact get into the group and Phil in fact did sing in that group for four years. Yeah. And it's a group that's typically not open to non-music majors, but Phil had graduated and there were several male singers that year who graduated yeah. and, uh, that kind of left like an, an unusual opening. Um, and I started singing in that group and, uh, a lot of kind of weird similarities like Phil had sung a solo for uh, Man in the Mirror by Michael Jackson in that group. And and then I sang a solo for yeah. Man in the Mirror by Michael Jackson in that group. I and you guys mash that up. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we, yeah. We, we do. And now we, well, there's that song has kind of returns to, I got to sing it on, on The Voice as well. Yeah, yeah. So that song has kind of, and now we sing it in our live act in the shade. So that song is kind of, it's like a weird kind of recurring tune as well. <laughs> um, but I say all of that to say, like, um, we we come from, like, kind of the same musical pedigree. And so while all of that was going on and I was kind of getting trained in music uh, at Miami, where Phil had gotten his, his degree in jazz vocal, um, Mark and I, you know, we would, uh, we were we were kind of, our, our claim to fame was doing this thing called Acoustic Night, where we would have hit him on acoustic guitar and me on vocals and a couple other of our <laughs> our uh, talented roommates on we did have a washboard player <laughs> oh really <laughs> among other things we would we would kind of jam and out jam out in the dorm room for anyone who would listen and um 
we kind of knew, I think, that this was something that we wanted to do together, but um, it wasn't until we all came here in 2012 that it became obvious to us that this kind of needed to become a formal thing. Maybe Phil can speak on that. Yeah. So w- one of the first gigs um, I was able to book myself here in Chicago was, it, was at, a, at a bar out in Vernon Hills um, doing cover music uh, for like three to four hours. And I was like, man, like that's... For, for one guy like who's just kind of getting started here, like, yeah. that's, that's a lot of music <laughs> I got to play by myself. And so Mark, I, I told him, I was like, hey, I got this gig. It's near home where he was currently uh, staying at the time. And yeah. I was like, why don't you bring your guitar? I'll set up a microphone. You, you don't have to sing if you don't want to, but you know, let, just bring your guitar and come, come help me out. I need, need some support. <laughs> and so he did. And like, next thing I know, he like, just starts jumping in on harmonies with me. And I was quite surprised because I didn't know he could do that at the time. I was like, how long have you been able to do that? And he's like, I've always been able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? it, literally, so, it literally so, just came like that. Like, just I mean, from like, I hadn't. I mean, I kind of knew. I knew he could sing a little bit, but I didn't know yeah. he could harmonize like that. And uh, so it be- it became our gig, and we would do it, you know, a couple times a month. And eventually, I was like, "Do you think? Do you think Andrew would want to come join us sometimes?" And uh, he was teaching in uh, high school, teaching high school in Chicago, and would take would take like the train from the city after teaching all the way out to the suburbs, meet us, and then we'd play till like, till midnight. Yeah. Um, and that, that's kind of where we, we started really realizing that singing together was something that, that made us all feel really good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, it kind of changed my mindset in terms of what I wanted to do goal-wise in Chicago as a musician, yeah. um, and not, not kind of going down that solo path anymore, but starting something new and writing together, and that's cool. Yeah. And you're all from, are you all from musical families? Were you brought up with a lot of music around you? Or the yeah, I mean, interestingly enough, all of the males in, in our family, I mean, Phil's family, have, have an ear for music yeah. where we can all hear something, sit down at a piano and, and play it. Um, and uh, our sister and our mother are also very musical. They, they just have to work a little harder at it. <laughs> <laughs> our, our mom is very into musical theater and uh, takes voice lessons, and, and she she loves it, and she, but uh, she, I think they get a little jealous and frustrated when they see us just kind of hear something and then just can can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you, Andre, are you... My mom, my mom sings as well, um, mainly in church, but she has a group also that she sings in that's actually kind of similar to The Shades, um, it's a three-part harmony kind of acoustic group. Um, my dad will tell you that he's a drummer. Um, <laughs> and in his head, I believe that he thinks that he is. Um, but my my brother is actually incredibly musical as well. Um, is a, a trained guitarist. And actually, the reason that I started playing guitar was because my brother, who's three years younger than me, started taking lessons. And uh, my my mindset as a kid was a little bit more stubborn. I was like well, the Beatles didn't need lessons. And so <laughs> therefore I don't need lessons. And so I will learn guitar quicker and better than you. And it did not happen that way. Um, <laughs> he is in, a, a very, very talented guitarist, uh, actually a talented singer as well. Um, but his passion is audio engineering. And so he recorded and engineered our most recent EP wow. that's coming out. Uh, and the single that was just released great escape. Um, and, uh, is a, a, a music producer now in, in New York as well. So I was going to ask you, but I was, I'll jump forward a little bit because I was going to ask you about the new album. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, Great Escape, just released on Friday past. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> very, <laughs> very recently. Yes. Yeah, very, very <laughs> recently released. Um, really enjoyed it. I think Thank I, you. I, you guys have been playing it live a little bit, right? Yeah, we have. I, I saw we you have. play it live. And I was going to ask you because, and I ask a lot of guys that I, sort of interview this now in terms of how you recorded so did you record that most of your album live in the room did you track it was it digitally or did you do it to tape how did you go about it this time uh i mean this time around it was really cool to have our entire band with us in the studio um because before we would like record you know acoustic guitars here and then we'd send it off and like have like you know the bass put in and somewhere else and uh so to have everyone there at the studio at the same time to kind of be in on the session was was a really cool new experience for us as a group. Um, and we would do piece by piece, uh, but to have everyone's kind of input as well in terms of like whether or not like, you know, we, we like this take, we want to do that one again, and um, really, really collaborative. 
process. And Great Escape was actually a little bit unique on this record because um, we had been, like Phil mentioned, we had been playing with this band uh, a lot. Um, and a lot of the songs, that, a lot of the original music that, that we have, they know. Uh, and Great Escape was one that we had not played live before when we recorded it. Uh, and so uh, I actually, I remember like actually us sitting down with acoustic guitars and the, our three heads kind of just being like, okay, here's how you play it to the drummer and to the bass player and to our additional electric guitar player and be like, here's what we hear and try to communicate that as clearly as we could and then send our drummer in and be like, all right, you're first. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like you're building this up you from do, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so this was, this was kind of the only track that you'll hear on the EP that was actually the the full band version of it was built in the studio in the, rather than built live okay. rather than built live okay cool and I, and and was it quick was it a quick process in this studio this time or i guess when you burn in studio time it yeah. has to be a little yeah, bit quicker right when when you don't have money it's kind <laughs> of quick by necessity uh, yeah. but what i think what's cool about this this record is that it's four tracks and we were in the studio for four days uh, and it wasn't a it wasn't a uh, it wasn't so clean that it was like one song per day, but essentially that's what it was, you know, like we had that much time. And so, um, everything that you hear was recorded over four days, um, at gravity studios at gravity. In, in, uh, in Wicker park. And then your brother engineered it. Yeah. He flew in, uh, nice. we, we, <laughs> we flew him in. <laughs> it felt good. It, well, it felt one of the things that was cool about this record was that, uh, we didn't have to ask people for favors to play on it. You know, we, we were able to, compensate yeah, them for their time them. Okay. and uh and bring him out as well which was cool yeah and i wanted to talk a bit about influences and i was um like i've been listening to a lot of your music obviously get game i listen to it anyway but i've been listening to it over and over getting ready and i like when i listen back um to miles made of inches mm -hmm. like i pick out on there and i haven't really I, I think i've seen you talk about influences a couple of times but one of the things i picked out only for a moment. Do you know an English guy called Passenger? Like an artist called Passenger? That really reminded us, like me and Kirsten were talking about that. I really reminded us of him. And then the path without those opening harmonies on that is like Crosby, Stills and Nash. <laughs> that's like, ha like, that is hands down. Like, it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's so, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. So Thank no, you, no first of all, because those are <laughs> huge. I mean, Crosby, Stills and Nash are yeah. huge influences of ours. I think we definitely had them in mind in that song in particular. Yeah. There's a couple a couple songs that come to mind. W one is uh, uh, Helplessly Hoping by Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And the other is called The Eye by Brandy Carlisle. Okay. Uh, and both of those songs are acoustic and have kind of three-part harmonies all the way through. It's not like there's one lead singer who gets the verse and then there's background vocals in the pre-chorus. It's like it's a block unit the whole way through. And that's absolutely what we were going for with that song yeah. and honestly i don't you know songs your songs are like your kids you don't yeah. like to play favorites but the path without is definitely one that uh i'm very very proud of just because um because of how it was written uh and because it's one of those songs where i mean it's it's so weird to like hear your influences and be like i want to do something like that and then you do it you nailed it i mean you nailed it in on that song well we we ho we definitely hope so but yeah. it it feels like it that's one that feels like like oh we got close to doing it you know um i think this is true for for many different artists but like the music that you're listening to at the time when like you're creating songs makes its way in into the songs that you're writing yeah. and that summer, I happened to be listening to a lot of Crosby, Sills and Nash, um, a lot more like kind of folk-inspired music, and that song just kind of just kind of came out one night, and uh, you know I made sure to like record a voice memo of like of like these chord changes, this kind of melody I had, and like that's that's how we do a lot of our writing is like we get like these ideas and into our phones, yeah. and then share them with each other, and uh, and uh, you know we had we had a summer in which we we were able to write, spend a lot of time writing, and. Uh, and that that one just kind of just just came out. It was like, you know, yeah. a day's worth of of just kind of writing and, and and tweaking stuff. And uh, you know, before you know it, there we had Pat without. Yeah. So, all right, then Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Who would be each? <laughs> Which one of you would be Crosby, Stills, and Nash in the group? <laughs> I think in that song in particular, I would be Crosby because I think he has the <laughs> super super high part, <laughs> <laughs> which would be me. <laughs> 
without all the drug addiction problems and, uh, and the liver uh, replacements. <laughs> without most of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I kind of, uh, I liken myself to Graham Nash. Yeah. Well, that, that leaves yeah. you. Are, you. are you saying that? Be- <laughs> Who do you think you are? I guess that makes <laughs> Steven me Stil- Steven Stills. Stills. Yeah, Stills is a great guitar player, yeah. though. Yeah. 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 Can, I be, can I be Neil Young? Oh, you could. Yeah. You could. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you alluded to it a bit there, and then one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is right. So, so coming up to the new record, what have you been listening to? What do you think's influenced the new the new record as you've come into it? been listening to a lot of a lot of stuff um man personally i i mean i listen to a lot of country music um and i i know that 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 definitely influences some of the uh the guitar parts that i that we come up with um chris stapleton is definitely an artist that uh, i know all three of us listen to pretty pretty regularly and uh definitely an influence on on this record the first record some and others was a very like country infused track yeah. as well so that that song actually was was written with a with a good friend of mine named jacob jeffries who's a phenomenal songwriter uh, he lives really in artist. no um and he he lives in los angeles but yeah. at the time was in new york and uh, i was staying in new york for a few days playing some shows and, and we just kind of wrote that one out, out of the blue one night and this is before the shades ever began, but it was like one of the first songs that like of mine that I had written that the three of us started singing along to, and it's made its way onto onto the record. Yeah. So, I think this this record's a little bit different than the last one because um, the songs were written over a longer period of time, yeah. so we we've been we were listening to more things. I think, uh, or it was like you know a little less focused. I think this one's a little bit more um, the. Great Escape is 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 uh, a little bit more like an echo of Miles Made of Inches, but yeah. uh, the others are a little more R and B influenced, I think, yeah. uh, which we we love also. Um, and uh, there's a there's a little uh, hip hop infused in there as well. <laughs> there, we have a song on the new record called "Stitch It Up," and uh, Andrew brought it to us, uh, the idea for it, and sits down and plays through it. And me and Phil were both like, you just wrote a country song, <laughs> which is, it's, it's only funny because he typically is so, so against any, <laughs> any thing country. And he could not believe that he wrote a country song. And then when we're in the studio recording it, yeah. he goes, okay, it's a country song. <laughs> <laughs> which, okay. So what's interesting about that song is, and it's not out yet, so it's hard to speak on it, I guess, yeah. but it was, it, so that song actually uh the the melody of it um so i i am not the primary guitarist in the shades and i i certainly don't try to be however i did learn when my my brother was motivating me to become a guitarist i did learn enough to be able to write songs uh on my own and so the the this particular song stitch it up the chord progression that uh, I had in my head actually was inspired a, a little bit by Chance the Rapper, um, and the the version that I brought to Phil, then Phil kind of took the guitar part and put his you know Chris Stapleton vibe onto it, and the version that you hear is more Chris Stapleton. Um, but I think the beauty of the Shades is that it can be both, you know, it can be Chance and it can be Chris Stapleton, uh, and it can be. Um, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash and TLC, you know, like um, those groups hold equal weight. Yeah. Yeah. Not in every way, but in, <laughs> yeah, yeah. in some ways, you know, no, but you can hear it on the, on the first album you can hear. I mean, that, that really is, there's so much variation between the tracks on that album in terms of, you know, I've already said Crosby, Stills and Nash, then country. Right. So it's, but it's, it, it's nice. I, I, I like it. Um, it. In terms of, your writing process and you've probably alluded to it a little bit already but your stuff is like really intricate uh, the harmonies and things like that so how does it typically work will one of you come up with an idea and then just bring it to the others and then you'll really have to get together and work through it is it yeah it's it's a uh it's a pretty uniquely democratic process um when everyone is singing, regardless of who who is like the lead singer on a track, when everyone is singing on your track, 
if everyone doesn't like it, it's not going to sound good. Mm. Or if everyone doesn't, you know, put their a piece of their soul into it, it's not going to sound right. And so, um, you know, I think we all kind of come with certain ideas or come with a melody or come with a lyric idea. But uh, in a way, like every songwriting session that we have, we're selling ideas to each other and, you know, competing in a friendly way with yeah. each other um, because we know that we're writing for ourselves, but we're writing for them too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it is absolutely like if one of us comes with an idea, the the song isn't complete until we've all kind of put our fingerprints on it. So, and in terms of like, and then this is another thing I like to talk about with people at the minute, the music industry now is kind of unrecognizable to what it was 15 years ago, maybe. Two years ago. Two years ago, mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess. How do you guys do that? Because I guess uh, th there are a couple of things I think about it. I think I have some feelings about, you know, the recent stuff about Spotify, you challenging the, the royalties um, case and things like that, which I thought was really out of order, given that they have no business if it's not for the artists who put the music on the site. But at the same time, I recognize what a massive opportunity Spotify is for people to get their music out. And I also think these days it's kind of going a bit back to um like there's a book up there uh, please kill me about the punk bands coming up and it's kind of you can go a bit to the sort of punk mentality where those bands used to record their own music you know put posters up all around the town promoted book venues book a tour do it all themselves and uh, there are still people doing that like the the poster outside john morland who's a guy from um tulsa oklahoma him and his wife do everything for his band. You know, they book the shows. She she does all of the artwork for his for his shows and things like that. And I think in that sense, it's a great opportunity. And I just wanted to like get your guys' take on where we are now and how you deal with that. Honestly, I think we might each have like a little bit of a, a different take on it uh, just because of how, I think how we approach today's industry. Yeah. Um, because obviously, like you said, there's so much opportunity that one approach is you could say yes to everything that comes your way and, you know, be screwed over or be exhausted, um, or, you know, everywhere in between, you could kind of take the punk mentality and, and stand up and say no to everything because this isn't right yeah. and never leave your living room. Um, and, you could also be part of a trio where someone says yes all the time. Someone says no all the time. And someone uh, is the mediator. <laughs> Someone's Cause I got a crick in my neck. <laughs> um, we kind of, that's, I mean, I think if we weren't, if we weren't the three of us, we wouldn't, it's not that we wouldn't survive in the music industry. We would just be very, very sick, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, because our personalities kind of uh, keep, it's like a checks and balances system almost, you know, we have to be smart about our opportunities. We have to be smart about the venues that we're choosing to play at. We have to be smart about where we set our ticket prices. We have to be smart about what gigs we're turning down. Um, smart about, uh, like recognizing our own value too. Yeah. Uh, which is definitely something that um, we've, we're, we're still working through in terms of yeah. like, you know, you know, doctors and lawyers and uh, you know, they, they get paid to do to do jobs at yeah. you know a very you know nice absolutely nice yeah. rate and uh, as as artists and musicians for some reason because it's something that you enjoy to do is kind of looked at as like oh you'll do it's this for one hundred fifty yeah, bucks right, right? Yeah, yeah. and uh, so us being able to like like Andrew was saying like say no to opportunities uh, because it's like you know this is this is where our we feel like our value is and if you want something that's unique like a three part male vocal harmony group to come and and be at your event. This is this is our this is, you know what it, what it will cost. And so we're we're willing to now at a point in our career turn turn stuff like that down, yeah. uh, for the right opportunities. But you guys handle all that yourselves. You you do all the booking and yeah. And we're yeah. we're currently independent. Um, and I, I I think it's phenomenal that as independent artists, like being able to put our music onto onto the internet and it's it's able to be heard by people across the world. Yeah. And like now with with Spotify for artists, you can actually see like the map. And like, see how many people in like different countries are, are listening to your music, and that that's um, that's amazing. Yes, that's, that's <laughs> no, that amazing was, uh, to me. Get, yeah, 
the, and I, I think there's the, the the sort of Spotify side of it. And then also, like, you know, I read an interview with Lord who was talking about how they made that entire first album with like a hacked version of Pro Tools and all of the, the sort of virtual instruments that were in there that she hadn't even bought. And she made an album that went and went. And that's the other thing. I mean, people can make music in their bedrooms now that is r- really good quality as well. That, that's actually how we made our first album was in Andrew's living room. And we recorded all of our parts and then emailed it around the country. We had uh, a keyboard player and drums in L.A. We had a piano in New York City. We had guitar in Miami. Yeah. Uh, just sending all our tracks around the country to, to get that complete. Um, I, I also think it's interesting. Uh, the industry has changed so much, but at its core, it's still it's still the same. There's still gatekeepers. Like We're not bringing our music to radio stations and and record stores but we still are we're pitching playlist curators yeah yeah so it there's still the gatekeepers and that's that's the challenge for for us doing it independently to figure out how to how to get people's attention yeah i was down in nashville last week actually and it seems to be the only place where radio still plays a really huge part in like in country songwriters Mm -hmm. careers they still have those radio gatekeepers but yeah absolutely i mean spotify has the tastemakers and the playlist curators now that it really it, it's really important right mm. interesting so writing is again i think in terms of lyrics so when you you're writing lyrics for the songs i mean you guys tend to write relatively upbeat stuff but then your lyrics as well are talking a lot about what's going on around you mm-hmm. and coming up to recording this record there's been a lot going on around you in the world has that um sort of come in what parts of that have come into the lyrics and i i didn't notice i think when you did the interview with voyage you mentioned that you know you guys do a lot with guitars over guns and working with those kids you know you see stuff that might feed into what you write so um one of my favorite memories of one of the songs that we recorded for this record is that uh the day that we wrote the song uh phil and i had a session after school yeah. um at a school called Evergreen Academy in in McKinley Park here on the south side. And uh, we wrote the song in the morning. We took it down to the kids in the afternoon, and we told them, like, hey, we wrote this song today. Can we play it for you? And you talk about gatekeepers. (laughs) (laughs) That was our first audience. We were like, well, if they don't like it, you know, we probably won't move forward. Yeah, they'll be brutally honest. Yeah, I'm good. Um, And they're, they're, I I mean, they're, they're, you know, kids are unapologetically themselves all the time. And so it was the right first audience. But of course, I mean, we use those influences. um, And I mean, a lot of our songwriting um, has become something that we like, we try and hold to a certain standard because we teach them about songwriting. And so we're, we're telling them like, here's how you should do it, or here's the approach you should take, or here's something you should keep in mind. And if we're not doing that, then we're kind of bogus teachers, right? So um, we definitely hold ourselves to that standard. I I love being able to write songs that are kind of like stories about someone else, but they're act- it's actually you. But you don't have to you don't have to say that. You know, I can become he, or I can become you, or we, or John. You know, and <laughs> yeah. and no one has to know. So I, I I think we're definitely influenced by the world around us. I mean, when it comes to the last year or two, I think. There were, it's a good time to be a songwriter because yeah. you're not a, at a shortage of things to say. Um, but there's enormous responsibility in that as well. And so I think it's, uh, it's important to feel the weight of that because people are listening, whether they're listening over, you know, a, 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 a massive Spotify playlist or listening in a classroom on the South side, uh, at, you know, three 30 in the afternoon on a Wednesday. I think as we move also into some of the colder months of the year here in <laughs> yeah. Chicago, uh, we're definitely going to have some opportunities to start writing again. Yeah. It's like once you, once you put out a project, you're already thinking yeah, about the, the next, next one. one. So uh, knowing what's been going on in the world around us, I you know I have a feeling that some some of that stuff's going to kind of make it make its way into into the new new tunes that we we start digging into. Um, we do like to write a lot about a lot about relationships and love, or um, you know it's, it's it's sometimes easier to write about heartbreak yeah. 
because uh, you're you're really in the moment at the time than it is to write about when you're you're super super happy. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, you're you're just happy. So I, yeah, you're out yeah. being happy. You're not sitting yeah. around yeah. at home with your guitar and like. <laughs> I've heard in a few so, different interviews, people say how how much easier it is to write like dark music or sorrowful music than it is to write happy. Y- yeah, right. Yeah. I, I don't know exactly why that is, mm. uh, but I it's it's definitely, it's definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's maybe definitely it's definitely ca- true. Maybe it's cathartic for the songwriter, right? Maybe that's a way of you know getting that off their chest. I guess At our our upcoming album in particular, all the songs kind of revolve around this theme of duality. Mm. Uh, where it's it's an internal conflict or someone being pulled in in two different directions. We have uh, uh, stitch it up and pass it on, love me or let me be, um, and and I think it it kind of like at, at the time when this was being written, we were still a band trying to figure out uh, our direction as a band and which way we would go and being pulled in multiple directions by cover gigs and. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and and <laughs> I think <Leave> <laughs> I think I think too you mentioned like it being easier to write songs about heartbreak. I think I think on uh, a certain level it's it's easy for listeners to relate to that yeah. as well. Absolutely. I think one of the worst things about like feeling like uh I think one of the worst things about feeling sad is that you also feel alone. Like no one understands what I'm going through. And so if you hear something where you're like, "Wow, that's how I feel." Yeah whether it's happy or joyful or sad or surprised or upset, whatever. Yeah. Um, like to hear something that you're like, Oh, I feel like that person's talking to me yeah. is an amazing thing as a listener. It's an amazing thing as a songwriter to feel like you've made that connection with someone. Yeah. Um, and the, the path without is actually one of those songs as well, where we've, you know, we've had people come up to us and say like, you know, I, I lost my grandfather like recently and like that song made me feel better. And like, <laughs> yo, yeah, like, I always that's it, not why I wrote it, but I'm glad that I did. Yeah. And as a songwriter, I think that, you know, there must be the standing in front of a packed room is one thing and having that feeling. But even more so, I think someone coming up to you and telling you that it connects on that level must be equally as amazing to experience as a songwriter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, it, you know, music, music has the power to really. Uh, cap- captivate your soul and like make you make you feel um, in ways that like you know you would never expect to feel and I know I know for myself like playing playing an instrument has always helped me feel better in times when I've like been upset or I've been angry and you know when we're working with with kids after school that's one of the things we ask them is like when you're feeling upset when you're feeling angry do you pick up your instrument and play have you tried that yeah and when and when they do I, you know I follow up with how how did that make you feel and 99% of the times it's like I felt so much better yeah. and so you know when when you are in in that mindset I know it, you just kind of gravitate when you have the guitar just sitting there you gravitate towards it yeah and you know half an hour later there you are you're you're feeling yeah, better or at least a little bit and I think it generally is a listener and and Kirsten will kill me because she tells me I always go off on a run and talk about the same thing but I, I, I it's because I believe it so much and I wrote a blog when we started the when we started Loud Hill, it just talking about the power of music and and speaking about you know the week we decided to set the website up was the week of the the shooting in Las Vegas and I'd I'd woken up and seen that and then it was and then Tom Petty died on the Monday after that and it was it was just like a horrible week and everybody was in a terrible mood and and we went to see a show that night uh, sorry on the Wednesday of that week and it was um it was Honey Honey at the um at City Winery. And it was like, I, I think the way I put it in the blog was like, it was like a pressure valve because mm-hmm. I was in such a bad mood that week. And then I went in there and then for two hours, I just turned my head off and listened to that music. And I think that's what music can do for everyone these days. You know, that later that week, we went to see um, Little Steven from Bruce Springsteen's band. Yeah. And he takes like a 12 piece band with him on the road. And we went in to House of Blues and he opens up with Even the Losers because Tom Petty had died. Right. And like, and everybody was virtually crying in the House of Blues, but it that's what it's got the power to do. And nobody's worried about politics. Nobody's worried about whatever else is going on outside of that room. You can get in that room with a band on the stage and it's a different world for two hours of your life or whatever it might be. I yeah. feel like we're, we're doing our jobs right. If we can, you know, affect people in that way yeah. to come out and like, you know, not think about 
other stuff that's going might be going on in their personal lives and just like be there be in the moment with us yeah. and even if even if it's for just a song yeah. or half of a song like that that to me is like the reason that like I, I play music and get up on the stage is to have that connection take people away uh, for for a minute or two like closing out what i was gonna say with you guys is we've talked about you know getting music on spotify whatever i i think personally the way to hear your guys music is to go and see you live um because your live show is fantastic and along with all the originals you do some of the best mashups i have ever heard in my life who what what's the process of coming up with a set for a live show <laughs> i mean that that's that's you're hearing the beer market sessions kind of more fleshed out than they were, you know, eight, eight years ago or whatever. Yeah. Um, that was where we were able to take risks and know that it was a low stakes situation where like people weren't really listening to us at that point anyway. And so if we're playing queen of California by John Mayer and one of us jumps in and starts singing (laughs) the way you make me feel by Michael Jackson and the, you know, the, the vibe is just like, follow me. And we'll see you at the finish line. That I mean, that's something that music does too. Is that uh, it's like it takes a, a lot of trust and a lot of faith, especially if you're if you're doing it as a social activity. If you're in a band, um, <laughs> sometimes it makes my 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 colleagues angry. <laughs> you know, if I do it in a in an environment where uh, you're not supposed to be taking those kinds of risks. But like that was where we at the beer market at the elbow room here in Lincoln Park. It's like your Beatles in Germany phase. It was like <laughs> the cavern it was like the cavern phase where we could take those risks, we could try those mashups, we could cross those genres and um you know the ones that the ones that we liked stuck and yeah. like are still part of our live act today. We used to do this thing and it was it was basically like musical improv. Um, where we we played a song that we called the Super Mash because it <laughs> yeah. started it always started out with Superstition uh, by Stevie Wonder and we literally wrote out uh, other song ideas I think on paper plates <laughs> and had had one of our friends who was who was at our show would just like toss them up to us at random <laughs> and one of us would have to figure out how to throw in that song in, into the song we were currently playing and nice. it just it's it was a lot of fun just to to keep everyone on our on their toes and. <laughs> yeah and yes and <laughs> yeah. i think very very rarely do we actually like sit down to learn a new cover and be like all right this one's going to be a mashup yeah um because I, I don't when when it's forced like that i feel like people know or people can know uh and so a, a lot of the covers that you hear whether they're mashups or not well if they're definitely if they're mashups a lot of the the mashups that you hear are um the result of like spontaneous um fun of just like being it like being glad that like we have ears that are able to yeah do that um and That's like a lot of, a lot of practice like, a lot a lot of practice and like i said a lot many, of trust many too hours, many hours in a room you know just like working on your yeah on your, on your skills i mean to it's not it's not something that we just woke up and like, Hey, we're able to do this. Yeah. Like it's, it's taken a lot of training and a lot of practice to, uh, to get to this point. But yeah, I think that's what everybody I've ever spoken to any musician, however talented they are, the number of hours that have actually gone into getting them to where they are as well is the bit that a lot of people miss. I think, you know, talent can get you so far. Well, that's I mean, when, when Phil was talking about kind of, uh, being able to define your own value, something else that you also kind of have to be okay with is, exactly what you just mentioned is the fact that like no one's going to know all of the hours that actually went into like you having this 45 minutes on stage where it looks like you're having a blast the whole time and you probably are um but like that's what you pay for as well you know that's part of your value is the amount of time that you're sitting in a room like this one like eyes to eyes to eyes just practicing and just figuring out like, okay, I'm going to say this here and we're going to pause here. And, uh, this song is going to go right into that song. Um, the type of stuff that like only if it goes wrong, people will notice. Yeah. But if it goes right, it's just like, Oh, that was the shades. Yeah, 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 exactly. But I, I agree. And I think if you're doing it right, if you're doing all that work, then you should have a good time on the stage. Right. And Kirsten, I, like we always say, you know, we cover so many shows for the website 
you can tell in a second when someone's just dialing it in. When someone doesn't want to be do- up there or doing it anymore, it really you, there's no way to hide that. And like, and you guys, when I say about the live show, you always look like you're having a good time. So, and it, and it's one of the it's one of the biggest things about going to see live music. You can see that in a band the minute they open up the first song, you can tell if they want to be there or not. Um, so thanks thanks so much for coming in. I think so. The new track Great Escape is available now on spotify and apple music everywhere we talked about yeah um people can go to your website to find out live dates have you got anything coming yeah the shades music.com is our new and improved website excellent um and we actually we do have a show coming up next month at uncommon ground in wrigleyville um which is where we're going to uh we're going to perform that night the night that the ep is released so October twenty fifth. It's a Friday, okay. Um, and we're uh, we're gonna be doing two sets. The first is gonna be all covers, okay. Um, and all covers, particularly that kind of influence these songs. Uh, and the second one, we'll play the record all the way through and throw in a couple originals that that people know as well. Oh, that's great! And people can get find tickets for that on your site on Uncommon Ground. On both, I believe. Yeah, uh, it will be on our it will be on our site shortly. It. Uh, was just recently, recently <laughs> announced. So. It just went live, I believe, on Uncommon Ground recently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very recent. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks so much for coming in, guys. Much appreciated. Thanks for having us. Trip on a train, another flick of the flame with you. So caught up in the wild, the seasons passing me by. I left my home, turning every stone I outdid myself. But now I'm alone, and you're with someone. Face to the facts of you. You never did look the part, pulling the strings of my heart. I believe in you, baby, that's my proof. You're just in time to reel me in or cast another line. Yeah.
Stay. 